Our next speaker is turning the advertising world literally upside down with his just released book, What Sticks? Why Most Advertising Fails and How to Guarantee That Yours Succeeds. It's currently number two on Amazon in the advertising category and has reached as high as number 13 overall in one day. Mr. Greg Stewart is the CEO of the Interactive Advertising Bureau. Greg is here to share the surprising findings from his book. So help me in welcoming Greg Stewart. Hi, Carol. Thank you. Listen, I'm always sort of curious to know, um, I'm all, people thank me before I speak, which always makes me a little nervous because I think it sets an expectation that in some way I maybe shouldn't be saying what I'm about to say today. Because honestly, what I'm about to present to you today is not good news. We have a very serious problem. And I've done an awful lot of research to really understand sort of the dimensions of that problem. And I will tell you that it's far worse than I suspected based on my experience or my gut. Because the truth of the matter is that we don't really know what we're doing. We don't. We as marketers have very little clue about how advertising really works. Shockingly so. And so actually, you know, you wanted me to come here and talk about the, how to increase the effectiveness of the advertising, which is such a nice title. Instead, I want to do something a little bit different. I want to ask a question. I want you to ask yourselves a question today. What if we're wrong? Now, unfortunately, I have some insight to the answer to that question, which is that we are wrong. We're wrong a lot, a lot, far more than we need to. Now, just so you know that I'm not just some crazy heretic that's been invited to your room who Carol obviously didn't sort of pre-screen sufficiently. <laughs> you had to think about that. You had to go, you know, if we laugh at that, we could just set him off. Exactly. Uh, I've had the opportunity the last five years in my role as the head of the Interactive Advertising Bureau to do research against a billion dollars of ad spending. Not a billion of online advertising, but a billion in total advertising spending across all media. And we had set out to do this research to solve a very small problem, which is what was the role of online in the media mix, right? You all were sort of begging to have an answer to that question a few years ago. And that was my job in the head of the IB to do big Uber research studies to try to figure that out. And collectively over the last five years, we've probably spent, the IB alone has spent probably $10 million in doing some of this research. Big deal stuff, that's important, right? Unfortunately, we started to realize that there's a very endemic problem in that by the time advertising gets to online, it wasn't working from the very start. That's a problem. And so my co-author and I started to sort of relook overall what we were doing. In fact, the first few studies we did, we came to the brands, it was Lexus and Dove were the first two. We said, this is great stuff, isn't this wonderful? Lexus vowed to sue us if we ever presented the information publicly, seriously. And Dove said, wow, this is great, and then never did a thing with it at all. And so we said, oh my God, we have a huge problem. We not only have people who don't know what they're doing, but they're in denial about it. <laughs> That's a real issue. It also sort of leads me to sort of believe if advertising industry had a slogan, would it be this, ads work wonders? No, that's not what our slogan will be. John Wanamaker actually did his quote, I know half the advertising is wasted, I just don't know what's half. So the tagline for advertising is, half the money is wasted. <laughs> that's what we stand behind. That's how we talk about our business. And then we laugh nervously like this. This is not good. This is not good when we don't have any predictability of what we're doing. Now, just so you understand, too, this research, I could spend a lot of time explaining the methodology, and I will explain simply some of what's going on here, because it is new and landmark. My, uh, my co-author who created it is actually a very, very smart guy. Uh, those who know him will back that up. But these are the brands that have done research studies with us over the last five years. There's about 30 of them in there. Understand a couple of things. Almost every single one of these brands paid for the research. They had to put money down. That's because we learned early on to do research with brands who didn't pay it was just an utter disaster. So we stopped doing that. But all of them going forward did, which means that they had to justify the expense. Some of these studies cost anywhere from $150,000 upwards of a half a million. In fact, we did one study for $600,000. Very expensive stuff. You need to make sure that you know what you're spending money against to spend that kind of money in any corporation of any size. So these brands did that. The ARF has signed off on this, the Advertising Research Foundation, which is an unbiased organization formed by both the agencies and the marketers about 50 some odd years ago. 
They have signed off on every element. In fact, every single study that is a public study that we took public, that the intent was to be public, the ARF has looked at in advance of our doing this and has signed off on it. They've also written a very paper that looks at the methodology and says it's good stuff. In fact, Jim Spaeth, PhD, Dr. Jim Spaeth, former head of the ARF, said it's the best research, it's the most even-handed treatment of all media he's ever seen. So that's good stuff. That's good stuff. We also, in the process of doing this against a billion dollars of research, surveyed 1.1 million consumers to understand what were their brand attitudes and brand attitude shifts, and also to understand what was the sales impact. In fact, when I show you the Ford study, I'll talk to you a little bit more about how we actually measured sales impact and linked it back to the advertising, because that was a critical, critical, important component of this. I'll explain briefly what the research is doing, just so you have a sense of it as we go through it. Um, Stephen Levitt was kind enough to write the foreword for the book. He's the author or co-author of Freakonomics. And what Stephen Levitt liked about this is that what Rex had applied was the gold standard of research called experimental design, sometimes called design of experiments. And what it means, it's what the drug companies, actually, it's what the government mandates the drug companies to do before they release, release, release a drug. And what that is is that you randomize your audience, Make sure that there is no bias in, way, in the way that you choose that audience or that you assign them to different groups and you split them in half. You introduce a variable to this group and make sure that this group has no idea that that variable is out there. Make sure the researchers don't even know who's seen that different variable. And if you're able to isolate, if you can randomize your groups perfectly, which we probably could do in this room unless we could discover there was some bias between those who sat on this side and those who sat on that side, and we'd have to think that through and make sure that there wasn't anything then in introducing this variable, we would be able to determine that this group was exposed, that their, their change in attitudes or change in behavior was a direct result of that one variable. Now, what Rex really figured out was how to do that for each medium, for television, for online, for magazines, even for outdoor, although that's a little more challenging, radio, all of those. It's all very focused on making sure that we randomize the groups and isolate the impact of a variable. And then use some complicated mathematics and statistics in order to begin to rebuild plans and understand it. But understand that we have groups here, large groups. We survey at the time, the Ford study, 30,000 consumers surveyed for that one study alone. Where I actually figured out, so what was, if this group was exposed to television, radio, and magazines, what about this group that was exposed to television and radio, but at the same budget level, same frequency, such that they, you know, that, we would, that wouldn't be a variable. It wasn't just the spending. It wasn't just the loss of a medium. It was a reallocation, if that makes sense. So if they saw five TV and five magazines ads and five radio, this group over here maybe saw seven TV, seven magazines, but no radio, whatever, whatever sort of the variables were. Right? Make sense? So that's a big deal. To the best of our knowledge, that has never really been applied. Here's the bad news. In the Uber of these studies that were done with major blue chip marketers, we've discovered $112 billion in advertising spend in this country is wasted. The total pie is $300 billion, so it's not all of it. That's good news, I guess. Ad Age was proud to say on the cover about three, four weeks ago, they said, we have good news. John Wanamaker, 100 years ago, said half his money was wasted. Turns out today it's only 37%. Now, that's got to beg a very basic question. What makes you think yours isn't wrong? What makes you think that? How can you sort of walk out of this room today with that basic data point and say, geez, how do I know I was right? How do I know I was wrong? Have I asked the right questions to do that? I actually love the advertising business. You should be very clear on that. I've been in the ad game for a long time. I moved to New York City from Seattle, Washington. In fact, I took a bus across the country. I don't know why. It just seemed like a, a romantic thing to do at the time. Um, I arrived in New York. It took me a while to find a job I did, and I worked my way through the ranks of the agency business, so eventually I was a senior vice president at YNR. And then I realized that we didn't know what we were doing. I got concerned, and I moved to the client side. Found out that wasn't significantly better, and I wrote a book. That's basically the story of my life. But I did that because really, you know, we need to protect this business. This is a great business. There's great people in it. I love the people in it. But we're killing it. We're killing this business. And that, I think, needs to stop. At least I'm going to argue for that for as long as we can. In fact, this sort of captures it, doesn't it? You say it's a win-win, but what if you're wrong, wrong, and it all goes bad, bad? <laughs> the problem is we don't really know too often. 
So here's kind of what we know. There's basically three things, and what we talk about in what sticks, there's three things you've got to get right. We call them the three M's. You'll see later I'm going to say there's four M's, but for right now, let's focus on the three. The three M's are motivations, messaging, and media. That's really it. We have to get a consumer motivation that works. We have to communicate that to consumers in a way that they hear it the right way, and that's really important, and that's where we go wrong. Not because we thought it in our gut. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. We're too close to our brands. We're at a meeting at Haynes one time, which you all know the products they produce. We went around the room. Rex says, hi, I'm you know, Rex Briggs from Market Evolution. I said, hi, I'm Greg Stewart from the IAB. Another guy says, hi, I'm John. I work in women's underwear. <laughs> he was too close to his brand. He didn't realize to outsiders that sounded odd, <laughs> especially in a business meeting. It just didn't get it, right? He was too close. We're too close to our brands to think that we can actually perceive their take. I'm not saying we shouldn't get to know our, our consumers. Not that at all. That's very important to this. But we can't assume that we've communicated a message that they actually hear and understand and respond to. So motivations, messaging, media. That's it, right? That's all you got to do. Here's the problem. We did the data. 36% of the brands we studied Blue chip marketers, Procter, Kraft, j and Ford, the host of others, 36% got consumer motiva motivations wrong. Didn't get it right. Didn't matter. Consumers said, ah, you got to be kidding me, I don't care. Or it was a small group that said, I care, but they didn't matter. Messaging, 31% got messaging wrong. The basic core of advertising is develop messaging that means something to consumers, and 31% of them were wrong out of the gate. Remember, blue chip marketers. I suspect the data's worse when we look sort of beyond that core group. And 83% had seriously suboptimal media mixes. Now, media is a little bit trickier. Media, you know, we're in such a spray and pray kind of world today where we just throw it out there that the media does have its impact. It does work if the motivation and message is correct. However, we found that there were serious flaws in the sort of motivations. Often it was spending, a few of the things that go wrong would be spending way too much money in television. We saw that universally. Not having a bit of the media mix. We talk a lot in the book, there's basic media mechanics that consumers, or that marketers just get wrong. For example, I'll tell you the one that really bugs me the most as an ex-agency media guy, which is I hear brands say, we haven't done a sufficient job in our core media. That's insane. That doesn't make any sense. It's the media mix that matters. It's the media mix that's critical. In fact, I would advocate pretty strongly, don't add online. I don't care. Leave online out of the mix. I'll set aside my job at the IAB, right? Although I wouldn't advise it, but to go ahead and do that. Still have a series of media because consumers have different media habits. I happen to be a heavy media consumer. Probably many of you in this room are. A lot of other people aren't. They watch a lot of television, nothing else. They, watch, they read a lot of magazines, nothing else. They look at a lot of online, nothing else, especially in the younger segment. So again, that mix becomes really critical. And I think the thing that concerns me the most is that we don't generally own a burden of proof. So our good friend Donnie Deutsch, glam boy for the advertising industry, got his own TV show, still running, doing a great job. Donnie's talking to 500 marketers at a conference. I was there. I have the video. Here's what he said. We did a wonderful spot on the Super Bowl for Mitsubishi Galant. It stops at the end and says, go see what happens.com, right? Very clever ad. Some of you might remember it. Actually worked. You know, it actually was impactful. I, I mean, I recalled seeing the ad. Donnie says we got about 600,000 clicks. Was that great or not great? We told the client it was great, so it was. <laughs> nervous laughter. Both Donnie and the audience, by the way, nervous laughter. That's what was funny about that. Now, I happen to know Ian Beavis, who was the CMO of Mitsubishi at the time, and he was very clear and articulate to me the success that that campaign had. What concerns me is that Donnie thought this was funny to say in front of 500 marketers who potentially could be the client for his agency, or yeah, clients for his agency. But I think that there's an unlawed truth in this joke, and that's a real problem for us. Now, I want to be fair to everybody here. Now that I've sort of come, and, like I said, <laughs> I get invited. People don't really look at the tape. They don't know what I'm going to say. Um, uh, marketing is hard. It is hard. In fact, Stephen Levitt was very clear. He said supply chain, simple. Other issues, manufacturing, simple. Absolutely perfect for a, a, a rocket scientist uh, uh, economist like Stephen Levitt. Marketing is messy. Stephen goes on to say, I happen to like messy problems, which is why he appreciated some of the work that we've done on what sticks. 
But this is how we sort of, this is one way to just frame marketing. Let's say that you've got five different options in a marketing plan. We've got five positioning, five segmentations, five creative approaches, five magazine schedules, five online plans. Those of you who are doing the math in your head would know that was 3,125 combinations. What are the chances you got it right? Can't be too high. And God forbid, that was a simple campaign. Let's take something that's a little more complex. It's got 10 options and 10 within each of those. Now we're up to a billion. What's the probability we're going to write? What's the old story? You know, 12 monkeys at a typewriter over 100 years will eventually write Shakespeare. Isn't that kind of what it was, right? <laughs> I don't, you know, I'm not calling anybody here monkeys. I'm just saying, you know, <laughs> it seems that's what we're doing. That's what we're doing, because at the end of the day, we don't really know exactly how advertising works. Also, too, Patrick mentioned, organizationally, we're a disaster. Compensation between agencies and clients, disaster. We, we screwed up the whole thing. It's all wrong. It's all wrong. Dilbert, actually, I think, put it best. Evo HR director, the company's goal is to double the efficiency of all its employees. Question, if we double the efficiency of our employees, won't you downsize half of us? Of course, don't talk to anyone in marketing. They aren't so good at math. <laughs> That's how people see us. And I think the concerns me the most is a guy who's been on the leading edge of this stuff. I, I was fortunate to get into the advertising, the interactive internet digital advertising business uh, back in 93, which is very early on. It was just prior to the introduction of that thing that we called the WWW, World Wide Web, as I recall, is what we referred to it then. But the future's going to be worse. We've got TV, we've got radio, we've got print outdoor, right? That's been our world landscape, right? What about we start throwing DVRs into the mix? Nielsen's finally going to get around to maybe measuring those. ABC made a stand to go ahead and try to count that because it's become so substantial. Broadband uh, penetration. 50% of the households now have broadband. Radically transforming the world of media. These devices we carry around in our belts, in our pockets, personal mobile devices with us all the time. Unbelievable opportunity. iPods. Games. Games are developing. If you don't know, Xbox, and well, actually, you probably do know this pretty well, Panasonic, I hope. But uh, the whole game environment with PlayStation and, and Xbox, you know, they're building network connectivity in those, which is creating sort of these massive opportunities to serve advertising within them. Even before that, they were doing advertising. It's only going to begin to explode for what is a very hard to reach audience, yeah, typically young males. So the world's only getting worse, right? It's only going to get more confusing and it's kind of easy. Now, the bad news is I just told you. I mean, that's an exciting world to enter in. The, the bad news is I just told you we're not good at what we're doing already. My guess is that we're going to have a new medium every five to seven years at this point. That's how fast it's happening. Look how fast that internet. I, the internet wasn't fast enough for me. I was in it. But pretty fast, 16 billion this year. That's bigger than cable, bigger than consumer magazines. It will overtake network television in the next year or two as individual media. That's how fast it's moving. And at the end of the day, my experience, my opinion, internet is actually a better medium, too, for a whole host of reasons, more which we can talk about later if you want. So, you know, Confucius said it, the real knowledge is to know the extent of one's ignorance. And I think that that gets it. We need to admit that there's got to be a better way. Every other part of the company has six sigmatized itself and come up with ways of figuring out exactly what they're doing. Instead, we have these situations where the CMO is sort of forced to kind of go to the CEO and say, you kind of talked about this, right? and say, well, you know, we're going to run a bunch of ads and see how it goes. We'll let you know. <laughs> Wish us luck. <laughs> That's kind of what goes on. I, 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 shouldn't re I shouldn't introduce a brand because it's going to get back to them. They'll get really mad. I had the opportunity when we were doing one of these studies to sit with the CEO of one of the, uh, not, not one of the American major automotive, but one of the um, foreign automotive companies. Um, he, had, he was the CFO who had just become the CEO. We were doing one of these big studies. They invited us there for, geez, he spent like two and a half hours with us that afternoon talking about what they were going to learn from this research that we were about to embark on. And in the course of that meeting, I watched this CEO, former CFO, ask his marketing person the same question five times. Those of you who report to a CEO will know that any time they have to ask the question five times, it's not a good sign. <laughs> the question was, in essence, what do you mean we spend hundreds of millions of dollars and we don't know what it does? He tried every way to ask that question. He got a bad answer every time. She did finally admit, she did finally say, um, actually, we're pretty good about measuring online, but it's the rest of the stuff that's difficult. That was unfortunately 2% of the budget, but that's a real problem, right? Now, 
I understand the difficulty in answering that question. And, you know, God love them. They actually went and did a study and figured it out. The unfortunate thing for that company, just so you know, you're really clear on the impact, the agency got fired, the CMO was moved back to Europe, and sales went down 3%. That's what happens when we don't know. That's what happens. Rightfully so. It should, because we don't have any predictability. The advertising didn't work. I saw it as a consumer. I said, I don't know what the hell this is. I called Rex, who was doing the research at that time. I didn't have privy to the insights of that study that early on. I called Rex and says, what's going on? He goes, ooh, it doesn't look good. It's not working. Consumers don't get it. They're clueless. It doesn't matter. It doesn't resonate with them. Miss the motivations, miss the messaging. The whole thing was off. Nobody had checked to confirm that advertising worked before they literally were spending hundreds of millions against a new campaign launch. So, what are we going to do? <laughs> I did come with some message of hope. I do have a clear sense about where I think we need to go and what we need to do on a very basic brand level. I I'm going to let Mr. Yamada and Bob and others sort of resolve the entire organizational challenges, because those are big and daunting. What Rex and I really had to figure out was, short of having a C-level executive work on that, how do we help you, on a day-to-day -day basis, make sure your advertising is working? So we took some prescriptive approaches from many of the marketers we work with and put them together into what is now What Sticks, the book, that tries to articulate what are the things you need to do around those three M's, and as I mentioned, there'll be a fourth M later on to make sure, to absolutely guarantee that your advertising is working. Because our thought is at the end of the day that if we can change people's basic behavior, the attitudes of the organization will change over time. That those problems will begin to resolve themselves. And some of these steps are very simple. And I, I wish I could give you a sort of a magic, like here's a phrase. In the book we call it COP, Communications Optimization Process. Obviously Rex and I aren't quite that creative. <laughs> that's not all that clever. Um, but that's sort of the auspices in which we did this from. But that, there isn't, a, there isn't the, the, there's an umbrella to that, but it's the individual actions that sort of make all the difference. So there's three things, though, that you've got to focus on, and I'm going to apply those into the three M's. The first one, Patrick talked about it, you must have universal agreement to goals. Except for one company, one brand within a company. In fact, it was the whole company, because I know the company well. In fact, I'll tell you, it was Procter & Gamble. We haven't found a single company that has universal agreement to the goals of the marketing campaign of the campaign, get together the, the research person, the agency. You know what, let me tell you from this perspective. I run the IAB, I was charged with putting together a campaign talking about the interactive medium, articulating it to brand marketers and agency people like yourselves. I sensed that there was trouble. I'm writing a book, I should know better. I got together my head of marketing, my research person, a couple of outside research vendors we had involved in the project, our ad agency in a room, and a, brand, and a, and a board member who was involved in this uh, process. And we had Rex come in and, and work with us for a living, because that's really what his company, what he does for a living. And he's been a good friend of the IEBs over the years of mine. And he took us through a process of trying to define the goals. The first thing I was really clear on, we'd written creative briefs. None of us agreed to what the goal of the campaign was. My marketing person did not agree with me. The agency didn't agree with us. The research company had a whole different view. We couldn't agree. And when I talk about sort of goals, I talk about making sure that you've wrung all ambiguity out of that. You know, let's say the goal is to increase sales. And Patrick sort of talked on some of this in his. If the goal is to increase sales, was that sales from new customers? Or is that sales from, from current customers? What happens if they come into the store and they buy another product and not the one that they were intending to, the one that we advertised? Is that still considered sales? Have we gone through that process of really defining exactly what we're trying to do? Like I said, there's only one company, Procter was the only one that we found that had very clear uh, uh, goals around that. And I can almost assure you that if we don't have universal goals, we won't hit the mix. I'll tell you the one that makes me the craziest. In so many of the studies, the measurement metric for success on the back end of the campaign was, look at all the great publicity we got for the campaign. What I call the Crispin Porter syndrome. <laughs> I'm not saying they're bad guys. They're doing very good work. However, 
are we clear that that was accomplishing the goal that we set out to? Because my sense is that we, we didn't. I've never found a creative brief, by the way, that actually going into it said the goal is to get publicity for the campaign. Second, have a plan B. Now, this forces another conversation, which is, are we clear that plan A is working or not working? Get that? Right? That's an important part of this. Have a plan B. What's your backup? What if the motivation isn't right? What are you going to do? Let's determine up front, before that campaign starts to air, what are the steps that we're going to take to make sure that this advertising campaign, whose shareholders somewhere have given us money to spend, is working as accomplishing the goals that we all, that they would expect, that we would expect. This one gets very complicated. This really gets into a lot of what Patrick talked about, about making sure that we're measuring the impact of what's going on. Do the motivations work? Does the message work? Does the media work? If not, then what are we doing next? And finally, know the value of your dollar. If you don't know the value of each dollar in that campaign, then really all bets are off. Now, that's kind of the good news, unfortunately. It may not feel like that. The bad news is that that actually is very tricky to do, and it's complicated and hard. I don't want to dispute that at all, and it takes a lot of commitment. I think that actually Patrick put it best. He says it requires, and I'll look at the gentleman in charge, it requires organizational change. It requires the commitment. That meeting to unify the interactive industry around a common goal wouldn't have happened if I hadn't stepped in. I had to. I have a responsibility to do that. And I've continued to raise that bar and responsibility. And not sort of vilify them for being, being wrong, but just make sure that they have the latitude, the resources to make sure this stuff is right. Because otherwise, it's just all too wrong. So let's look at motivations here. I'm going to take, I'm going to take and apply those three principles to each one of the th three M's just to sort of give you a framework for some of this in a real quick way. So the first one we mentioned, motivations. 36% uh, uh, missed it. Just so you're clear what I mean by motivation. So it's a very basic do the dogs eat the dog food kind of situation. You know, do, does, the, does the consumer, does the, does the motivation we picked resonate with the consumer in some way? It also, though, gets into segmentation. Have we picked a group that's large enough to work? Right? that's large enough to respond to the motivation, you know, that, that will have some material impact on the business. And that, one's, that is tricky. And also, too, it gets into positioning. And positioning is really tough because positioning is like standing on quicksand because it's always moving. Because your brand's changing, the, your competitors are changing their position, you're changing yours, and the whole world's moving the whole time. So you've got to stay in touch to make sure that you've stayed on top of that. So, again, it's complicated. Anybody know whose headquarters this is by chance? I've only ever had two people answer this. I mean, you'd think like BMW, right? A stylish, design-oriented company, maybe, you know. Obviously, it's European. It's very cool. Well, it's ING. It's a financial services company. Shocking, isn't it? This is a financial services company. Now, internally, they pride themselves on innovation. That's a great corporate mantra. The challenge is, is that they put that mantra, that internal corporate mission, into their advertising. In fact, their advertising looked like this. Excuse me, what is that? ING? They're a fresh thinking financial services company and they're always coming up with new ideas so you're ready for whatever comes along. Actually, I know what ING is, but what is that? <laughs> come on, my friend. Come, 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 come. That's Shakespeare in the park. The speeches I pronounced to two, tripping on the tongue. Ask your financial professional about ING. Okay. The campaign is called Fresh Thinking. Okay. How many of you pick your financial services uh, companies, providers, uh, so on, uh, based on their uh, on, on fresh thinking and innovative innovation? Yeah, that's what the research showed us too. In fact, in a larger group, it's actually number 10 on the list of 10 motivations for why people pick financial services. So that's a problem, right? We picked a motivation that worked. Now, I, I want to be careful here. I don't want to criticize ING for having taken a risk and trying to position themselves differently. That's okay. Problem is, that campaign ran for three years through two different iterations before they went, oh, oh, oh it's not working. <laughs> that's what they got to. They got great brand name recognition. They were new to the US, and so it really worked from that standpoint, but that wasn't the goal. The goal was to persuade consumers that there's a place you want to do business with. No, you pick a financial institution based on your ability to, like, don't lose my money. Help me manage it. I don't get it. Take care of it for me. Those are the reasons you pick on my national institution. So, to their credit, these are the ads today for ING.
The world can be a complicated place. But when it comes to your money, ING is making it easier. See why it's easier on the bench. Ask your financial professional about ING. Your future made easier. So at a very visceral level, don't you just kind of go, yeah, that makes sense? Yeah, you really do, don't you? You look at those two and you go, I get it. I get it. The challenge, like I said, is that it just took them two years to get there, and that's a problem. So again, get universal agreement on success. Why do consumers hire your brand? Are you targeting a valuable customer segment? Have you wrung all ambiguity out of that definition, like I mentioned before? Is it sales from new customers, current customers, more volume? What exactly are you trying to, or is it, not, you know, and uh, for, forgive me, it's not always just sales. I'm going to just use that example. Sometimes it is really brand awareness, at least, but let's understand that whole chain of events as sort of Patrick talked about in his presentation. How do we go from point A, point B, point C? Because at the end of the day, actually, it does become sales at some point. And I don't want to diminish long term value. That could be measured, too. A little more challenging, but it could be measured. But let's make sure, at least in the short term, that we're doing what we need to. And then be ready to ask yourself, what is the motivation isn't right? When will we know that? And what's our backup plan? What if we all agree to do in advance to go after that? In fact, this sort of capture, what do you think? Should we get started on that motivation research or not? <laughs> it's not really all that funny, but I still kind of like it, so I keep it in there. Um, let's talk about messaging, OK? I'm sure all of you as children have played a game telephone, right? So what happens if I came up here, I gave Bob, if I, said, if I said a phrase to Bob, it went around, let's say it just went to this table, it didn't even go around the room, right? What's the chances that it's going to come back to me, back to me correct? Not even close. That's in essence what advertisers are doing wrong. We do a couple of focus groups, we hear, we hear something in the focus group, the agency writes an ad, goes grab something from the focus group, puts it into the strategy, that's what happens. I work there. That's what we were doing sometimes. And then we'd roll out the ads to the consumers. And then sales didn't move. Attitude shifts didn't happen. If, God forbid, hopefully we got brand tracking at least in place. And we'd go, huh, I don't know what happened. Things must have changed. Got great publicity for the campaign. I don't know. <laughs> I don't. That one, you can tell that one really gets me. 31% um, missed messaging. This is how consumers see our ads. <laughs> How do you know they're not seeing yours this way? <laughs> you know? Because we do a focus group, and we write ads, and then we run it. We never do a confirmation point to say, did the consumers hear it right? And there's very small changes. We had a huge problem. Let me talk about online for a moment, because I come from the IAB, and so that's part of what people sort of expect to hear from me. When we were doing these studies, I told you we, we discovered a real problem. We, we suddenly discovered that the online ads weren't working, and we realized that the television ads weren't working, and we realized the whole damn thing was kind of a mess, and so we went back and sort of started from ground zero. But in looking at some of these campaigns, which were, in essence, sort of cross-media research, even when the TV worked, we noticed the online wasn't working. We had some serious problems. And so we started to make the, make the, the clients do um, uh, creative testing in advance to just confirm that the consumer was hearing the messaging in the way that they intended. So there were five recent studies that we did. These were some of the bigger studies with some of the blue chip marketers. One of the brands required no adjustment. Campaign was fine, ran just as expected. Two of the brands' campaigns were half the ads were off, didn't work. Consumers didn't get it. They had to go back and redo them. Two of the campaigns had to discard, discard the entire campaign and start all over again. Didn't work at all. The bad news, those are the advertisers. These brands and their agencies had an inability to look at online ads and to know that they were correct or not. But why should they know? What makes us think that just intuitively we're going to be able to look at online ads and know that they're working? I mean, just to be realistic with ourselves, I think that's putting way too much burden to think that we're going to be right. So we need some confirmation point until we build up a body of knowledge that we really start to understand that our ads that, that we, we start to get some rules of the road. We start to understand some stuff that says, hey, you know, these elements will work and this kind of stuff doesn't work. I had an interesting conversation with it. I was asked to lead a, a panel of creative people one time. This guy had run one, one this creative director, uh, one show awards, he'd run a con, he'd uh, won, I mean, really, he had the Clio. I mean, he'd, he'd, every show he'd won awards for a particular campaign. And I, and I looked at the campaign and I said, um, you know, you don't mention 
the brand. There's no logo, nothing in the ad itself until you click through. And I go, that would strongly suggest that these ads would be hugely ineffective because 98% of the people have no idea who the brand is. He said, yeah, that was kind of a real problem. <laughs> he knew it. They didn't change the ads. They went and won awards. It was pretty. Somebody out there thought it was good. Obviously, a bunch of creative people, his peers, thought it was good. Didn't work. I knew it. I just looked at it and said, not going to work. We confirmed that. And I'll show you how sort of subtle this can be, too, just so you think, well, maybe you've kind of done an awful online, you know. Here's some Colgate ads, two ads. These are animated frames from their online rich media ads, right? The only difference, it might look a little bit different, the only difference in these ads is the tube of toothpaste further up in the can, in, in, into the animation frame, right? That's the only difference. So we tested these ads for purchase intent. Ad B went up two points, not 2%, but two points. And those in brand management worked, you know, Colgate's a 100-year-old brand, go, two points, that's pretty good. We'll take that, two points. You know, we move our business that far. Well, that's, that's happy for it. That's a, that's a good day. I'll get promoted in six months like I expected, right? Ad A, 20 points. That incredibly subtle difference resulted in a dramatic change in the effectiveness of that advertising. 20 point, not 20 percent, 20 point increase. Went from 35 percent to 55 percent. What are the numbers? Well, I, can't, I can't give the real numbers. I'll show you the ads again. That's it. That's all there is. Two things. We should do more research, but here's what we think is going on. One is that consumers interpret messaging in the context of what they see and know, right? They, they, they have to interpret the whole picture. So here we see a bunch of teeth. We don't know what they are. We don't know what's going on. We don't know the message is leading. And then it comes back as it's cold case. So we've got to associate that up front to this here. In the top ad, we go, it's toothpaste right away. Right away, I know where you're going. I know the basic thrust of the message you're going to give me. I know the, the category of body part that you're dealing with, just to narrow the field a little bit. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm kind of wandering out there in space wondering, what do I know? Because I wouldn't. That's what happened. The second thing I think is really important. So, so putting the brand, associating the brand with the advertising as fast as possible, we found to be very important. The second thing is that online must, this is the, if I was to give you one bit of advice, this is your take home tomorrow. You can use it this afternoon, whatever your day is like. This is the one thing. Online advertising must pass the glance test. We don't sit and sort of interact with online advertising in the way that we do television, which is that it tells a linear story, right? We set up a problem, we create a solution, we associate the brand to it. I'm not so sure television works that way anymore either, given consumers' attention spans. But I'll let somebody else deal with that. That's another trade association's problem. Online passes the glance test. It must pass that glance test. They must get it, get the brand right away. Otherwise, it's all lost. They'll just lose it. So what do you do to make sure the messaging sticks? Creative testing is cheap. Just do it. Really just do it. There's going to be a whole big discussion. There's going to be a lot of debates. A lot of people are opposed to that. Figure out a way to make that work so you have some confirmation that this stuff is working before you put it out of the box. I know a lot of brands that are actually starting to test online, because online is really cheap to do. It's cheap, you know. And you can test your motivation, your basic messages online, and then I've seen them roll it into their television campaign as a way of sort of confirming. It's just a much, it's a more economical way to do the process. One approach. Certainly, not testing, really expensive. If those ads don't work, and you know, I'll tell you sort of another one here, and I want to be sensitive to my time, but um, um, you know, Proctor had a real difficulty. They were one of the brands, you know, in the, uh, the five, two ads didn't work. Proctor was one of the brands in the bottom. They've come out and admitted that publicly. And they had an interesting situation. The online ads didn't work. Campaign was due, was live on Monday. This is Wednesday, whatever, right? Proctor says, doesn't make any sense to spend money against ads that doesn't work. Now, I will tell you in our experience, that's rare. A lot of people would have met the timeline, met the deadline, because that's kind of what management wants. They're going to criticize you. They're going to criticize you for missing a deadline, but wasting money is OK. Right? I mean, that's the dynamics of the world that we operate in. 
So, you know, we certainly have to manage our timetable different to allow for these kind of changes. But to Proctor's credit, they actually stopped the whole thing. They paid the cancellation fees to the online media that they owed. They went back to the drawing board, four weeks had ads that worked, rolled them out, went again. A lot of work, a lot of wasted money. Would have been better if we gotten it right out of the gate. Didn't. It's a new medium to be expected. But to their credit, they really went back and did it. But that's rare. Um, I can talk more about sort of the research and split cell testing, but it's, it's split cell testing is one variation of that, what is called experimental design, sort of, you know, and I can talk to you more about that. And the big question is, what if you're wrong? Would you know it and when would you know it? Right? That's the issue here. When do we have confirmation in the marketplace? Is it, is it, do we wait until the marketplace? That was kind of the answer they gave at the automotive company. They said, well, you know, after a couple of weeks, we start to get a sense how it's working. But unfortunately, they didn't because sales went down and they didn't change it and they didn't have a plan B and, you know, all things trouble. I will tell you, though, that company, just to their credit, they really learned a lesson because they went and relaunched another automotive brand, another brand for the automotive line uh, later, and they got it all right. And they redid the research, too, just to make sure. And they went through the whole process all over again. It was a painful lesson for a lot of people, both personally and professionally and, and for, the for the business, but, uh, but, they, but they got it right. Oh, by the way, Wanamaker wasn't wrong, turns out. 47% of the campaigns that we looked at either missed motivation or missed message. So 50% of our ads are wrong. He was right. Next, let's talk about media for a minute. 83% were suboptimal. Uh, this is a very complicated section. I could spend sort of all afternoon talking about it, uh, which uh, you haven't invited me to do, so I won't. Um, the big issue here is understanding your diminishing return curves, right? And this is, uh, this is uh, McDonald's did a new menu item, grilled chicken flatbread sandwich. And you can see right here at this point that the advertising stopped working, right? In fact, that was 20% of what it was a television and radio broadcast budget. So what we went back and recommend, actually, this is the researcher. I'm an ad guy, so I would have said spend all the money. But he went back and said cut 6.4% uh, out of the budget, put it back in a drawer, save it for a rainy day, reinvest 14% in online. Print didn't make sense in this because it was a short four-week campaign. So online was the only real backup option we had. And, what, and that shifted the entire diminishing return curve up. Media mix matters. I told you before, it's the big deal. Mix is probably the simplest solution to a lot of things we have facing us today. The net, five-point gain. So what was a two-point gain for 20% of the budget became a five-point gain against 14% of the budget. Significant changes, right? Now, part of what's happening there, and this is actually from Colgate, this is actual real data. I've seen this theoretically in my agency life. We did this a lot as, uh, when I was a media guy. This is the actual data. And what we have here, if you can sort of understand the chart, we've got heavy, yeah, there we go, heavy online across the top, heavy TV on the right. So heavy online, heavy TV consumers, there's 38% of them in the U.S. or in, in this, who, who are exposed to this campaign, I'm sorry, to this particular campaign. So this is changed by media mix and everything else, 38%. The challenge is, is that Colgate was running like one and a half, two percent of their budget online. That was 26 percent of the people that were heavy online but light TV. So Colgate was making a strategic decision by not employing online to ignore 26 percent. For them, that was 34 million people. I didn't see that in the creative brief when they put it together. The marketing plan didn't include that strategic decision, but that was the result. That was the impact of the decisions they made. Important stuff. Consumers see a lot of different media. They have a lot of different habits. We've got to be really focused on that mix. Let me talk a little bit about Ford, too, and I want to sort of relate this back to some of the research. Remember when I talked about the split cell testing, okay, or experimental design, sort of how that works? Ford was probably the first example we had about what really happens when we isolate the variable of just online and relate it back to sales. In fact, it was the first time we tied the marketing spend, each dollar spent, to an actual sale. We did that by pulling every single DMV record in the country, surveying the media habits of 30,000 people, and relating everybody who bought that truck by their DMV records back to the people who participated in the study. Pretty audacious task. Big, complicated, very challenging, no doubt about it. But what we found is that when we isolated those audiences, we were able to figure out this group saw no online, this group did, how many trucks did they buy more? 21% was the number. That 2.5% of the budget against about a $200 million total campaign, about $5 million of it in online, 21%. For Ford, that's about $750 million in sales. That 21% translates to 6% of the total sales. Get it? $750 million based on a $5 million decision. 
break. Ford announced last August, it was, it was, it got, it got, uh, we're not really, it was sort of quiet and yet it got some pickup. Ford announced they were putting 15% of their budget into online, into the digital media, I think is how they described it, last August overall. That actually is a lot of money spent online. I'm not sure they could actually do that, but that was their goal. They, and they felt it was important for them to come out publicly and say that. Part of the reason was because of this research. So, media is an investment. If you don't know what the value of a dollar is, you're never going to be able to optimize that mix. And the average gain we saw when optimizing mix is around 35%. So you've really got to get to that point. You've got to get there to know the value of each dollar. My co-author likes to use the phrase test, learn, and deploy, right? Something actually that uh, Johnson Johnson is actually very good at, they talk a lot about. Listen, I'm going to talk about one more, uh, one more M and then I'm going to close up here. The other fourth M in this thing, after media um, uh, uh, messaging, uh, I'm sorry, uh, motivations, uh, messaging, and, uh, and media, is what we call maximization. Now first, you've got to get the first three right, you've got to get the metrics right, you've got to be pointing in the right direction. But we think that the bigger missed opportunity here is that we're not, using, uh, we're not using media advertising as a real, true competitive weapon. That we can go to the CFO and say, or God forbid the CFO comes to us and says, we've got to crank sales another 10% marketing, go make it happen. Imagine those days. Instead of us you should go and beg and plead. When I was in the agency business, a little inside story for those who are on the client side, my account executives would come to me on occasion when I worked on Proctor, the most sophisticated advertiser, right? We all guessed. They would come to me and they'd say, get the client to spend more money. I says, on what basis? They said, we don't care, make something up. And I did. And 50% of the clients would spend more money and 50% of the time they didn't. That was how it worked. We're all making these sort of loosey-goosey decisions. So let's talk about maximization. The concept here is applying sort of innovation theory, classic Silicon Valley tech innovation theory to advertising. And what, if you've heard, uh, you know, Eric Schmidt and others talk about what they're doing, you know, they'd spend one day a week focused on other outside products, projects, right? Stuff that might be helpful to the company but aren't in their core stream. So the way we sort of divide it up is the 70-20-10 rule, which is take 70% of your budget, make sure it stays against the stuff that's working. Take 20% of the budget and put it as extensions of stuff you know that's working, but change it a little bit. I'm going to show you an example of some of that. And then take 10% and put it in the brand new stuff. Now, let's be clear. It's not as one marketer who said to us, he goes, you mean you want me to waste 10% of my budget? And we said, what are you doing to measure the other 90%? He said, well, nothing. I said, well, then it seems to me you're wasting more than the 10%. Right? Measure it. Set up the metrics. Be clear about the goal and make sure that you know exactly what that 10% is doing and then look to see if it's an opportunity. In fact, the way that we define it in the books, we talk about make sure that it's effective and then work really hard to see if you can make it cost effective. They're two different things. Don't discount an idea just because it isn't cost effective immediately. Make sure that it's effective first. If you find something that works for your brand, that moves the needle, attitudes or sales, whatever your goals are, then figure out whether or not you could do it more efficiently. We had a situation with Proctor, they, done, they did an online campaign. They ran like 40 ads over eight weeks, uh, average frequency. Really, I mean, that's like beating the consumer with a club. It was just way too much. But we need to get a read of work that was very inefficient. We figured out, though, that one ad a week online was actually very effective. It was cost effective. And now they run with that. So now they know, they have some data. Let me show an example of this. This is the Ford F-150 campaign I just talked about. We measured for sales. Um, these are the online ads, the beautiful online ads. They really were. They did a phenomenal job. Um, and I think they communicated really clearly. We tested them. They really worked incredibly well. And they said, you know, that's great. We know that online works for us. In fact, you know, cars.com and Autobytel and the other brands, you know that there's sort of this endemic area where consumers aggregate around car making decisions. That's a great place to sort of reach them. But then they said, you know, I wonder, though, if we could use online differently. I wonder if we could use it as a, um, as a mass reach vehicle to maybe kind of get the word out. And so what they chose to do was to run a home page takeover ad, I'm going to show you in a second, as a roadblock against the home page of the three big portals, AOL, MSN, and, and uh, well, <laughs> not MySpace yet, but <laughs> AOL, <laughs> Yahoo, and MSN. So that was the big opportunity there. So let's get a sense whether or not this could work. And what they did, interesting enough, they ran it for one day. So it was, their te the television started on Sunday during NFL kickoff weekend. The Saturday before that, they ran this online thing. Let me show you what the ad looked like, at least as it ran on, on MSN. It 
didn't quite run that way at home, but it was pretty close. Depends on if you had the speakers turned up. So you got it? Homepage takeover ad, right? Came up quickly, communicated the message, received it in the background. Consumer wants to find out more. They can click here and go do that, right? Very powerful ad. It was incredibly effective. Incredibly effective. Far more than we would have guessed. But remember, the goal here was to find out, can we sort of use online to more get the message out, to launch a, a campaign, in essence? That campaign, in one day, reached 43% of all men 25, 59 in the country. Not 43% of those online, 43% of every male in the country in that one day. That is incredibly powerful. Ford now has a whole new tool in the toolbox. They have something, as Rich Stoddard, who's a real truck guy, said, we're going to go out and kick the competition's ass with this information. And they've set out to do that. Now, what's even more interesting about this particular one, not only, did it have, not only was it effective in terms of meeting their goal of having broad reach, which was what they were setting out to do, but this is the sample data for what the cost effectiveness of, of the different media in their media mix. That roadblock, we just sort of sampled here, they're not the real cost, and we want to give away that confidential information, is about, let's say, two bucks here, index of almost 200. Television, is 20 over $20 to accomplish the same goal, which in this case is a change in consumer's purchase consideration. That roadblock is 10 times more powerful than television is for them. Partly because of diminishing returns, partly because of creative, partly because of a whole bunch of factors. But nonetheless, Ford has brand new tool. The online stuff, the base online, 20 times more powerful on a cost effectiveness basis. Ford was measuring the impact of their media. They made the decision to put 15% of the budget online. They know exactly what's going on out there and continue to test and evaluate. It's a big delta. Think if you had that in your mix, if you had some new thing, and I don't know if the homepage roadblock is it for you or for your brands or your target. You'll have to figure that out. But that gives you a whole new orientation to how we competitively go begin to target our customers and move our businesses forward. You know, it was kind of referred to earlier, um, I think, Carol, you said it, knowledge has power, right? Tr Peter, you were quoting Peter Drucker. It controls access to opportunity and advancement. And so the question I think I'd sort of ask ourselves is not what if we're wrong, but what happens when we're right? What happens to the share of our product or our business or our company when we get advertising right? When we stop doing all the promotional stuff that sort of moves the needle because it makes the CFO feel good. And yet, at the end of the day, if you haven't read the data, you know, promotional couponing stuff, which you probably don't do a lot of here, but you know, that, that works for current customers. It doesn't work for new customers, and yet it's always positioned as sort of this trial campaign. It just doesn't do it. Advertising is the most effective tool, according to the research, in terms of moving the needle on first-time users, introducing new products, and so on. So, you know, is it a magic formula? It's probably a bit of an overstatement. But here's what we try to articulate in the book and so much more. There's basically three things, right? Get the agreement to the goals, have a backup plan, and know the value of each one of those dollars. And then apply those against each one of the four M's. And we can ensure you that your advertising at that point will work. Thank you very much. Oh, no, no, wait, wait, don't clap. I have one more. I forgot. Oh, this is my favorite one, too. So I'll close with this. Dilbert said, the ad campaign was a huge, huge success. Wow. Define huge, huge success. How much did it increase sales? We don't, we don't track those numbers. But I know it, the ad created a huge buzz because of all the email I got the next day. How many messages did you get? Uh, six, but, but that's a lot for one topic. Wow, six. Um, how many of those six were from our own employees? Of course, who invited the researcher into the room? <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody. I appreciate your time.